Welcome everyone to Shrinking Production Instance by Damodaran. Uh, we're very, very glad that they can join us today. Thanks, Sudat. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Damodaran Rajalingam. Uh, shortly, uh, people call me as Damu. Uh, so I work for Google uh, in the Sydney office. Uh, I've been with Google about for about uh, uh, seven years, close to seven years uh, in the Sydney office and uh, been an SRE or in an operations role for about uh, 15 years. Okay, so that said, uh, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, uh, <clears throat> as mentioned in the in, uh, uh, introduction and as in the, on the screen, it's a shrinking production in, uh, incidents or a database approach to setting engineering priorities. Uh, so what we will talk about uh, is like, uh, what are service outages, like uh, di different phases of service outages, what we can learn from them. And based on that learnings, like how we can set engineering priorities, uh, how we can use uh, those learning to identify um, opportunities to improve the uh, reliability of your service. Okay. Oops. I'm in the wrong window, sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. So, <coughs> sorry. Before we delve into the uh, presentation, uh, uh, I would like to mention, like, we'll be discussing this in the context of SRE. Uh, for those who, who haven't heard it, it's a site reliability engineering. Um, what is SRE? Uh, so SRE is something which Google came up uh, when the Google leadership uh, realized, like, the traditional op system uh, is not uh, going to scale. In a traditional op system, uh, Usually, uh, you uh, you add people to solve the problem in a linear scale as the service grows, and there is also a kind of like a split between uh, the product and the ops teams uh, in a usual uh, uh, ops team uh, in a traditional ops system, and it can lead to some frictions. Uh, so, SRE is something where um, you <clears throat> convert this ops problem into a software scalability problem or a software engineering problem. So you incentivize people to solve problems through automation uh, or making the system automatic uh, instead of uh, and uh, instead of manually uh, handling the issues or doing repetitive toil process. So that's basically what uh, SRE's uh, fundamental goal is. And one of the advantages of SRE is like uh, it incentive uh, it aligns the incentives of management development and operations as i said earlier like uh, in ops world uh, in where, where i have been before uh, there is usually this tension between the product team and the operations team the product team wants to roll out features as fast as possible and the operations team thinks like you change make changes to the system you break the system so there is this natural tension and there is no common vocabulary to talk with uh, either of the teams. So um, SRE aligns the incentives for the management uh, development operation teams using uh, common vocabularies. And uh, the other thing that comes out of it is like, you let the product uh, development uh, velocity, um, it means you, you can have as much velocity as possible with and also enforce uh, reliability. So you can make trade-offs and you have uh, by aligning these uh, priorities. So how does uh, SRE basically achieve that? So what are the fundamental concepts of SRE? Um, so the three things that drive SRE, uh, fundamental concepts of SRE are like error budgets and SLOs. Uh, so this is SLO is basically like how you reliably, uh, how you measure your user uh, satisfaction with your service. And error budgets is like, uh, how much of that SLO budget can you burn uh, in making feature releases or doing tests or uh, or in failures? And then blameless postmortems. These three are the fundamental concepts uh, of SRE, which allows, um, uh, which uh, drives product velocity and while keeping the reliability. Uh, so this is a very high level one and uh, uh, you can visit this link, google.com slash SRE uh, to know more about it. And I think there are a couple of books uh, on that, which delve much deeper into that. Okay. So why are we talking about reliability, right? So 
happy users stay unhappy users leave uh, this is especially true now like the internet landscape is quite competitive and uh, sorry uh, if your users are unhappy they are going to find a different product uh, it's easier to move uh, so what what's user happiness like uh, the obvious thing that comes to mind when we talk about user happiness is like uh, okay does the product has x features like does it have this awesome feature does it have that uh, uh, this specific feature right um, that's what we basically advertise on uh, but that's not what uh, I'm going to talk about here. Uh, the thing which you are going to talk about here is uh, another feature which is not usually advertised but um, implicitly assumed it exists is uh, reliability. It's, an, uh, it's a feature which kind of users don't notice when it is present but certainly gets noticed and uh, talked upon when it is not present. If your service is unreliable, obviously users are not going to stay with your service. So it is the most important feature, I would say, given that I'm a site reliability engineer. <laughs> and uh, because there's not much point if you have awesome features implemented, but users are not able to use it when they want it. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about uh, reliability, what disrupts a reliability? That would be a service disruption or an outage. So um, systems of these days are like really large, complex and distributed systems. And in these systems, it's not the question of like whether there will be an outage, but uh, uh, when that outage happens and what, what is its impact. Oops. Um, so, <coughs> So we will be discuss so this presentation is mostly about like uh, we will uh, dissect the outages and see what we can learn from that outages and uh, apply that to improve the reliability of, reliability of our system. Uh, before so before going into that, we'll see like what are the different uh, how are uh, the stages of outages and how it affects our users. Uh, so here we see like the red bar and the blue bar and uh, so when you are in the blue bar, it uh, we say like, okay, you are above your SLO target, right? So user is happy. They are using your product. Uh, <clears throat> let's say like you made a, a release. Uh, you, uh, you are releasing a new feature and and something starts going bad. Uh, user starts seeing some issues with your site. And that's when your outage begins. Uh, so note that like uh, at this time, uh, the on-call is still not aware like there is a outage happening. Uh, they could be having their lunch, they could be out uh, playing uh, or they could be doing some other work. And after enough of your SLO burns, uh, your monitoring picks it up, uh, the on-call gets uh, paged. And now the on-call uh, acknowledges. So their phone goes off, they acknowledge the page, they start looking into like, oh, okay, something is wrong with the service. What do we do now? What happened? Um, and they start uh, working on it. Okay, so the time when the outage starts and when uh, the on-call gets to know about it, uh, that's basically the time to detect. And, uh, uh, so we want to keep um, how, depending on how impactful uh, the event has been, we, we, we have to kind of like tighten this interval. Okay, now that all color has uh, worked on the issue, they have uh, mitigated the issue. And now the user experience has started to uh, improve. The users are uh, happy with the service and uh, uh, things are getting better. So the time uh, from when the on-call gets uh, uh, notified or like when the issue gets identified and uh, when it gets mitigated, that's what we call the time to mitigate. Okay, things are going fine for some time. And as we said, like outages do happen and uh, 
the next outage begins. And the time between these two outages is what we call the time between failures. And uh, so uh, think about like what, uh, what happens if we uh, shrink the time to detect or time to mitigate or the time between failures or uh, we see like the uh, or like what would what will it be like if we change the slope of this uh, curve? Well, basically, means like how bad, uh, how quickly the uh, service gets bad. How what if we kind of uh, slow it down or flatten it, right? So that's basically the goal of this talk is going to be like. That's what we basically call is like shrinking these production incidents. Okay. So an outage happens, and how much? Does this outage cost you? Like there are direct costs for an outage. Uh, that could be loss of revenue. Uh, users are frustrated with the service and they are going to leave the service. Uh, they, the friends they have talked to about the service, they may not join your service. So you're going, your user is not going to grow. Uh, and uh, in these days, like uh, you, depending on the size and impact of the, uh, uh, of the outage, uh, you may even uh, appear in the headlines or you could be uh, trending in Twitter. Yeah, so these are uh, yeah some of the costs of having an outage. Now, think about this question. Like, so how much would you pay to not have this outage? So that's uh, basically the question that will pop on our mind, right? Okay, so... Now let's think about like what, how, if we turn this question around, like early, I asked like, how much would you pay to avoid this incident? Now, uh, if we turn around this question, like now that you have paid, like we talked about that are direct costs. Now you have paid with this outage. What can you learn from this outage? What value can you extract from this outage? Uh, or put it other way, like you can consider this outage as an un unintentional investment. You are not looking to make this investment, but there, there you are. You had an outage, you made this investment uh, with an upfront cost of like lost revenue or lost users. Now you made an investment and you want to extract value out of it. So that's basically what uh, postmortem is. Like postmortems <laughs> turn this question around this, like what you can learn from the outages. So what are the goals of a postmortem, right? Uh, the first goal of postmortem is like the incident is documented. Uh, like you have documented like such an incident happened, when it, when it happened, why it happened. Uh, because having this repository of uh, postmortems allows you to know, uh, like uh, it will help you to understand your systems better and uh, uh, help in prioritizing what you have to work on. Okay, and the next important thing is like, uh, so you had an incident and you understand all the root causes uh, that contributed to the incident. I want to highlight the all. So usually we think like there might be one or uh, there might be like one root cause that caused all this incident, right? But in many cases, like there may be more than one root cause. Also, you can also think about it in this way, like, like that could be one root cause that actually triggered the outage. But let's say like, after the use uh, on call got notified, uh, they would have taken longer time to mitigate the issue. Now there's a root cause why the on call couldn't mitigate it fast enough. So there could be multiple root causes uh, in that uh, outage. So it's important to identify and document all these uh, uh, root causes. Okay, now you have identified the root causes of the outage and uh, the next thing is like you have to figure out like how you can avoid these uh, the recurrence of these outages in the future. <clears throat> so that gets documented as action items. Uh, so when you are writing, uh, so when you are trying to formulate these action items, uh, you kind of your goal is to kind of like not only prevent the recurrence of this particular outage, but you should also be looking at preventing uh, the occurrence of a class of these outages. And, and it's also very important to know, like, uh, like uh, you shouldn't stop at just documenting these action items. Uh, we should get uh, uh, make sure that these action items get prioritized uh, accordingly. 
uh, in the dev roadmap or in the SRE roadmap or in the product roadmap, wherever, like whoever uh, has to take action, they have to take these action items. Uh, so that's kind of like uh, the understanding we have. Okay, so what do we write post? When do we write postmortems, right? So you write postmortems on any significant undesirable event, like a huge outage, or even uh, outage that was a near miss, or like it could have affected the user experience greatly, but it didn't affect, and you got lucky. Uh, so the SRE motto in Google is like, hope is not your strategy. So uh, just because you got lucky, you shouldn't hope like you will continue to have that luck. So in case of even near misses, you should uh, write incident, uh, uh, postmortems. Okay. Uh, the other thing to uh, realize here is like writing a postmortem is not a punishment. Like, <coughs> uh it, for me it's it's another way of another kind of like a creative thing like so i had a uh, i dealt with an outage and i now kind of think in a different ways to fix that issue uh think about like when you are working on a product like many times when we write something when we implement something uh, we think that it is a good feature and we implement it postmortem is kind of the other way like it has already shown you that it's a very important thing to be implemented so Writing a postmortem is not a punishment. It's uh, uh, it's a rewarding activity, uh, personally and even for the product. Okay. Okay. So we talked about postmortems, right? So how uh, it fits in. Uh, the another. In, uh, so we talked about like what is a postmortem? What and when do we write postmortem? Uh, Another important thing uh, about postmortem, the uh, basically that the linchpin holding all this together is the culture of blamelessness. Say uh, you are an on-call engineer and you got paid saying like, okay, uh, your system, uh, you are having high memory utilization or you kind of have uh, some sort of failures, like users are seeing failures. And the on-call engineer looks at the playbook and say like, okay, this could be because of memory uh, leaks or something. and. Uh, or based on their past uh, experience, they think like they are going to restart the servers and they restart the server and that ends up being counterproductive. Uh, instead of mitigating the issue, say like it uh, amplified the issue. Uh, the thing here is like, um, when you write the postmortem, you don't uh, ask like, why, uh, why did the, uh, you, you basically kind of don't point your finger at that on-call person and say like they did something wrong. But instead the uh, postmortem basically delves into like, why did uh, the engineer, uh, <coughs> so, uh, so, okay. So why the engineer was not prevented from uh, restarting uh, so many servers at once? Or like, why was this not, uh, or use the postmortem to kind of make sure like we clean uh, all the bugs in the system, uh, in the software that resulted in these memory leaks or resulted in these errors. So in the culture of postmortem, the first thing is like, we assume good intentions, like the on-call engineer, uh, we assume like the on-call engineer did their best at that time, based on the tools and information available to them. Hindsight is obviously 2020, like, after the on, after the incident is resolved and you look back, possibly some things could have been done different. But uh, the thing is, like uh, the on call basically did what they could at that time based on the information available to them. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the uh, the first thing. Like we assume good intentions. Uh, next thing is like identifying causes without implicating people. Uh, for example, let's say like I was the person who actually restarted the servers and uh, that resulted into an outage. Um, so when you're writing the postmortem, it's uh, important to say like, uh, 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 not to say like a uh, restarted the server. In instead it says like, okay, the on-call engineer had to restart the server. Or like, uh, let's say like I, I submitted a change which resulted in an outage. And uh, instead of saying like, okay, Damu's code, 
uh, you basically will say like, okay, the change number one, two, three, four uh, had this bug. So you basically kind of don't point fingers at the person and uh, instead you actually um, uh, implicate the causes, like what happened, the actions rather than the uh, person. And uh, the intention here is not to fix people, right? So as we talked about early, like we assume like they acted uh, with good intention. Uh, the um, goal for us is to fix the system. Why did the system allow the on-call engineer to do something that's unsafe? That's the question we have. Uh, again, to point it like um, uh, the solutions, uh, uh, for example, like, yeah, when we are, um, we do not point at people for blames, but when uh, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, the solution to the problem doesn't involve people. For example, uh, what I mean is like uh, the solution doesn't always have to be technical. Uh, sometimes like um, uh, the problem could have been that the uh, on-call engineers uh, may not have had good uh, incident management training. So that's something which is systematic in organizations and uh, that involves uh, human, like they have to be trained appropriately to so that they are able to manage incidents. So uh, uh, though the blame doesn't rest on the people, the solution could uh, involve people. And uh, uh, yeah, so for a postmortem to be very effective, uh, you need to get to the bottom of the issue. Like you need to know why it happened and how it happened uh, and what can be done. For that to happen, uh, the person, uh, so the people uh, who are on call or who uh, were involved in the outage, uh, they have to be not scared away and they should feel free to kind of uh, write, uh, they should uh, feel free to uh, express their views or like to document what exactly happened. If there is uh, no safe environment for them to uh, record what happened uh, with high fidelity, then the postmortem is not uh, useful because you, are, you haven't found the actual issue. Um, for those people in upper management, uh, I would say like um, uh, you should uh, think about like how you can drive blameless culture uh, in your organization. Uh, because as an engineer, it's very difficult for someone to not pass the blame uh, if the uh, upper management is intent on pinning the blame on someone. So it's kind of like, uh, it has to be driven uh, from top. Uh, okay, so that's uh, basically like uh, what a blameless postmortem is. Okay. So uh, we talked about uh, different stages of outages and what a, uh, a post-mortem is, like how we record uh, what happened and the action items, right? So now, how do we focus, where do we focus our efforts, right? Uh, when you have a critical mass of post-mortems, you will see like patterns start to emerge, uh, sorry, patterns start to emerge. And you'll be able to identify like where there is a frequent lapse of something or like which is, where, where do we have gaps? And then uh, you can apply uh, uh, some of these engineering tasks to fix those um, gaps. Uh, again, the uh, list here is not an exhaustive list. It's something uh, there's good representative uh, set of list uh, that has helped in Google where we apply uh, in Google uh, to uh, uh, to improve or like reduce. Uh, the uh, impact and duration of uh, incidents. Um, so if you look at this, like the time to detect is basically like uh, the fundamental thing where we, that what we improve there is like defining and measuring a failure. How do we define uh, what a failure is and how do we measure it? Um, the time to mitigate is basically, uh, it's a human problem. How much, how are we training them? Do we ha have we given them the, a good environment for the on-caller to fix the issue? Uh, or they overloaded. So this uh, is what time to mitigate uh, will focus on. And how do we ensure like um, the service runs uh, uh, without outages uh, or like the time between outages is uh, longer. 
Uh, that is uh, basically uh, fundamentally boils down to the engineering discipline. Okay, so from here on, like uh, we will uh, zoom into the uh, uh, each stage quickly. Uh, the time to detect. Uh, so as we talked about, the time to detect uh, starts uh, when the issue, uh, when the outage starts when the user starts to see the issues. Uh, and we get notified when your SLO uh, budget starts burning so fast, right? Uh, so your SLO burns so fast, like you are going to uh, eat up all the budget. That's when you get notified. Uh, on call cannot start to act on issues uh, that already uh, that they don't know about. So uh, there is a trade off here. Like uh, if your outage has been really very impactful uh, in this uh, short uh, in this time to detect, then we have to tighten the uh, time to detect. Uh, it, the trade-off is like if you um, alert too quickly, uh, probably you will be paging someone at midnight uh, on a transient issue. If you alert too fast, no, sorry, too slow, then uh, you have made lots of uh, users unhappy. Okay, so what are the basic things for uh, uh, basic uh, things we need to uh, do for shrinking the time to detect? The first thing is the refining the SLIs. So what is an SLI? SLI is a service level indicator, right? Uh, so this is basically what you define as a, a good user experience. It could be latency. It could be like uh, availability of your service. Uh, you say like uh, if a user is able to send an email, that's a successful operation. That's an SLI. So uh, or the latency, like how long uh, it takes for their uh, request to be served. Uh, so how to have good SLIs? The uh, first thing is like you have to close it, uh, sorry, measure it as close as possible to the users. Like uh, if you can instrument the client uh, uh, and measure the latency and availability there, uh, it is good. So you want to kind of like uh, measure it from the user's perspective. Uh, this could mean like, uh, it. May, for example, if you are, instrumenting it in the client, it could mean like uh, the user could be seeing issues uh, because of flaky networks or something systems uh, that's out of your control. But that doesn't mean like you shouldn't uh, measure it at the client. What this gives you is like uh, figure out like how often they face these outages and uh, prioritize it if like uh, these uh, external dependencies are affecting your user happiness and you can uh, engineer it around. Sometimes it may not be possible uh, to instrument your client. Uh, then you can approximate it with some probers that simulate clients, uh, or you may kind of do uh, different sort of measurements. But you need to be aware, like uh, when we are doing something like that, uh, we do not uh, we are blind to some of the aspects of user experience. And the other thing is to verify against uh, external sources. A good SLA is something that uh, goes up when the user is happy and goes down when the user is unhappy. Uh, so we have had, so for example, like, so you have an SLA defined and you get alerted on that SLA and you check with your user, they don't see any issues. They are happy about it, which means like there is a mismatch between your uh, SLA and the user expectation. Or the worst thing is like you define an SLA which doesn't page you and but the users are seeing outage. So you should verify with your, you should talk to your user, you should uh, and understand like what matters to them and base your SLIs uh, accordingly. Uh, so now you have SLIs, uh, then you need to set a target for that SLA. That's what we call the SLO, uh, service level objective. Uh, similar to how you refine SLIs, uh, you also kind of iterate on your SLOs. Uh, uh, it should again kind of like user focused. Uh, there is a cost to setting uh, like uh, you should make sure like uh, you don't have too relaxed of an SLO that it doesn't uh, ref reflect user happiness. You also should make sure like it's not too tight. Uh, uh, you should understand like there is a cost to uh, adding more reliability. Uh, like uh, the cost could be uh, exponential. Moving from 99% to 99.9% .9 could cost you 10, 10x more 
uh, engineering effort or complexity. Uh, so <clears throat> you need to understand uh, your users uh, requirements and set your uh, SLOs accordingly. Okay, so now you have uh, SLOs and uh, the next thing is like your alert should be effective. Like when an on-call receives an alert, they should uh, feel confident that that alert actually means something. Uh, it should be effective and uh, it should be user focused, which we have talked about. Like uh, you receive an uh, alert, it means there is a user issue. Uh, it should be sensitive enough and actionable enough. So we already talked about uh, uh, having like sensitive and actionable alert. So it's kind of like a fine line, uh, a trade off that we have to iterate and uh, like find it after a few iterations sometimes. Uh, you may not be able to strike the balance right away. Uh, sometimes your monitoring might be too sensitive and your alerts are not actionable, like your alert on transient issues or your alert is like <clears throat> too slow and uh, you actually uh, 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 get notified when the outage has become much bigger. Okay, so we talked about how to measure uh, define and measure uh, service failure, uh, which will, which when improved, will shrink the time to identify the issue. Uh, once you have identified the issue, the next thing is like uh, uh, how to shrink the time uh, required to repair the issue or the mitigate the issue. Uh, as we talked earlier, like this is uh, mostly a people uh, issue. Like uh, you need to have good policies, you need to have training, and of course. Uh, another important thing is like stress management. Uh, it's also the most one of the uh, most important thing uh, in handling the incident. Another thing I want to highlight here is like uh, uh, the first thing the on call has to uh, focus on is mitigating the failure. Uh, sometimes the curiosity in an engineer can get in the way, and you start uh, when the incident is happening. You start digging into the code and the system to find out what is the root cause. Uh, but uh, to emphasize like the first uh, action uh, that the on-caller has to take is to mitigate the issue. Uh, this could be like uh, draining the service out or it rolling, back a, rolling back the update. It could be uh, anything, but debugging the code and trying to fix the code comes later, first after the mitigation. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. Um, so what can you do to improve the time to mitigate, right? First thing is like you have to train the responders. Uh, you should have emergency procedures defined, documented, and tested. So it's important to have them uh, tested. There's no point in having an emergency procedure which is not tested and when applied, it doesn't work. <clears throat> uh, the structure should provide, uh, so the procedure should provide enough structure and protocol. Uh, at the same time, uh, it should also be flexible enough so that the on-caller can do some ad hoc exploration. Uh, the other thing is like, uh, you should, uh, training doesn't mean training only the on-call. Uh, sometimes the incident spans <coughs> more than the uh, SRE team. Uh, you may have to involve the developers, you may have to involve the product uh, managers, you may have to involve the, um, uh, <clears throat> someone else to manage the communication. So you, the training should, uh, you should try to train uh, everyone that could possibly be involved in an incident. Uh, the next thing is like uh, running practical and theoretical uh, feature drills. Uh, in Google, we kind of, uh, have, uh, some teams have this weekly uh, exercise called a Wheel of Misfortune, where you kind of, uh, uh, what do you say, trigger a failure, uh, say in a non-production environment, or you simulate a failure, and uh, you have a volunteer who tries to debug the issue. Uh, yeah, most, most often it's not a volunteer, you get voluntold, or we even have a tool inside uh, where we kind of actually runs a wheel of misfortune and selects a name. So you are the you become the lucky winner uh, who gets paged on this training incident. 
so what this uh, allows you to do is like uh, <clears throat> uh, it keeps uh, your team trained on the uh, emergency procedures. Uh, many times this this could become rusty, and uh, it also kind of gives them the critical thinking and uh, to figure out uh, how to debug issues. Uh, and uh, they know how to escalate. Uh, so they can actually uh, practice this in a safe environment so that when it actually happens, uh, they are confident of handling it. Okay, uh, writing a suit of runbooks. When you get an alert, the first thing that on color looks at is the runbook. Uh, so the runbook, uh, that should be a runbook for every alert. And the alert, the runbook should have a uh, enough details for the on-caller to kind of uh, figure out how to debug the issue. Uh, there's a, again, in my experience, like uh, you should, that should, it should not also be kind of too verbose. You shouldn't write a research paper uh, or the entire design document uh, in your uh, playbook, uh, run books, or sometimes uh, some, uh, some of them call it as playbooks. Uh, so it should kind of like uh, <clears throat> have a, uh, what are the special response uh, procedures. Uh, it should have links to dashboards. Uh, it should uh, have uh, clues for investigation, like what to search for in your uh, uh, debug logs. And the other uh, trick sometimes we do uh, inside Google is like, uh, so when you get an alert, uh, the alert has details about the entity, like oh, this particular job or uh, is having an issue. Uh, this particular job running in this particular location is having an issue or in this environment. So when you go to the dashboards, you have to obviously apply these filters to focus the data uh, for that particular uh, entity. Uh, so if uh, your tool allows uh, the links to these dashboards should pre-fill it so that they don't have to go and fill it uh, every time. Uh, this makes it easier for them. The other thing that, uh, that helps is like it avoids human error. Like you don't put in wrong values in the filter and you look at a wrong data. The other important thing is like, <clears throat> when you write a runbook, uh, you should write it from uh, the perspective of a newbie. Uh, as a person who's very experienced with that alert, sometimes you tend to assume like people reading that runbook uh, know about it. Uh, uh, but most often, uh, but you'll be surprised uh, when you uh, actually ask someone else to go through that runbook. <clears throat> I will just link it back to the theoretical, the uh, failure drills. Uh, this is a good time to kind of run a, a wheel of misfortune and ask the uh, person, um, the uh, person doing the drill to run through the uh, playbook and follow the playbook and see if they can actually uh, debug the issue and if there are anything missing. So that's, it's very important to make sure like uh, uh, it has all the relevant details and uh, in, uh, by running uh, failure drills, you should also verify it often that the runbooks are up updated. Uh, the next uh, thing is like uh, responder fatigue. Uh, being on call is is a is a stressful uh, job. Uh, it's uh, it's a big ask, right? So and keeping the pager load uh, down so that you don't overwhelm the on caller. Uh, is uh, very important. Uh, so one of the rule of thumbs we have in Google is like <clears throat> uh, two incidents per shift is kind of like a manageable pager load. It could differ based on companies and teams, uh, but uh, you should have some uh, notion of like uh, how much pager load is acceptable. And uh, you should uh, make sure like uh, the pager load does uh, remain below that limit. <clears throat> eliminate uh, the other thing that could uh, uh, contribute to the uh, fatigue is toil, where you have to do manual repetitive tasks. Uh, you should automate uh, most of those uh, things so that uh, uh, to reduce the toil and uh, uh, reduce the fatigue of uh, the on caller. Uh, the other important thing is like shedding load. So uh, I will talk about other things. So like, um, so when you have an on-call rotation, uh, so shedding, okay, shedding load in two things. One is like the number of uh, in pages 
The other thing is like too frequent or too many on call uh, 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 on call shifts, right? So you, your on call roster should be uh, well sized so that like people have people don't become on call too frequently. Uh, in Google, we have kind of like uh, recommend like <clears throat> uh, an on call team has at least six engineers. Uh, so, and uh, if you are not able to have that many engineers and you have lots of on call load, uh, one way to shed the load is to kind of like have uh, a part of your dev team to also be part of the on call roster. Uh, so that uh, you can shed some load uh, from the uh, on-call team and uh, help uh, uh, and avoid burnout of the team. Okay. Uh, so what are the so the other important thing that will help you in mitigating the uh, uh, issue is having good dashboards and logging. Um, it helps the on-caller have uh, uh, relevant information. Uh, for the for debugging the outage, uh, <clears throat> another of SRE principle is like measure everything you can, uh, log all your response codes, uh, all the error codes, uh, uh, mutexes, whatever you can. Um, uh, but you also need to keep into consideration like this is going to uh, have some costs. So make sure you have reasonable. Uh, retainment limit so that you don't blow up your cost. Uh, so having uh, good dashboards and logging uh, helps uh, the on-caller to quickly pinpoint where the issue is. Okay, so now we have mitigated the issue. How do we keep uh, the issues from recurring or like how do we uh, make sure like uh, there is a good amount of time between the next failure uh, occurs? Uh, so when saying this, like uh, I'll also kind of try to warn, like sometimes you may get too hung up on like avoiding failure, like keeping this time between failures uh, to be very long or never happen, which is a wrong thing to concentrate. Uh, failures do happen. And uh, thing is like, you shouldn't get too hung up. It, it's an important thing to fix, but you shouldn't get too hung up on uh, ex uh, increasing the time between failures. Uh, it has cost like uh, when you get too hung up on it, it has cost like uh, slow uh, slowing your feature releases, uh, adding engineering complexities, uh, <clears throat> uh, and all those things. And also, there's a minor side effect like let's say like you have a service which hasn't paged for quite long, and when it suddenly pages, now you have an on caller who's not experienced in actually handling the page and. Uh, um, which could be a bigger, which uh, which means like they will take lots of time to mitigate the issue. So yeah, so maximizing the time between failures uh, is important, but uh, don't get too hung up on that one. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, like uh, maximizing the time between failures, uh, it basically boils down to engineering discipline. So you have to foster a cult culture of quality, like no like monkey patching the code or um, cowboy coding stuff uh, make sure like the code added is like uh, roll roll forward and roll back compatible uh, so follow good practices and code reviews so code reviews is something which will help you to enforce these uh, good practices you send your code to someone else who can actually ask questions about like hey this looks bad can you fix this so um, code reviews is a good practice which uh, you should follow uh, test coverage requirements ensure like uh, your code is tested well in Google. Like uh, what we do is like every change list uh, automatically runs every possible test for the change list, and you can submit the change list only if all these tests pass. So uh, we try to uh, make sure like uh, the change that's going in uh, has uh, has been tested uh, thoroughly. And looping it back to the code reviews, uh, when you do code reviews, you kind of also make sure like enough tests have been added to cover the functionality. Okay, so the other important thing that uh, uh, helps uh, maximizing the time between failures is CICD, which is like continuous integration and continuous uh, delivery. Uh, so automated testing, uh, which we cover, already talked about early, like uh, 
you should have all your tests automated. Um, every change you make should uh, be tested thoroughly. And the CI/CD pipeline, having a CI/CD pipeline allows you to kind of ensure like the tests are run automatically. Uh, the other important thing uh, when we talk about continuous integration and continuous delivery is like uh, the gradual rollouts. Uh, in gradual rollouts, what we mean by that is like, so uh, this is basically what prevents uh, your sadness loop, which we talked about in the graph earlier. Uh, like it doesn't go steep da steeply downwards, uh, eating all the SLOs, SLO budget. <clears throat> You release your new feature to a small set of users, compare their errors and latencies and performance with users that already run old version. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I'll think I'm slightly over time. I'll finish it in another five minutes. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, so you uh, you gradually roll out it to increasing a uh, set of user population. So that like if you introduce a bug, you don't affect all of the user population at once. <clears throat> this is a very uh, fundamental uh, means uh, technique which uh, which will prevent uh, huge outages and reduce your blast radius. And then automatic rollbacks. <clears throat> it is very important to make sure like uh, the version you are releasing can be rolled back safely. Uh, uh, in a distributed system, there will always be more than one version running. And you have to ensure like the data format shared between them, the uh, RPC protocols between them, they are compatible between versions. Uh, the other thing which we do uh, in some of our teams is like uh, every release automatically gets tested for rollbacks. Like you roll out that release, uh, you roll back one version, you roll back two version, uh, and you make sure like uh, you can roll back up to your compatibility window. Okay. Uh, obviously, the other thing is to have a robust architecture. What is a robust architecture? So uh, it is where like your system is able to uh, satisfy the user queries, even in terms of like uh, significant internal failures. Uh, some of the good practices around is like don't have a single point of failure, uh, have a redundancy, and have graceful degradation. Like if uh, see if you can actually uh, have like good partial responses instead of like totally failing uh, the output to the user. Like uh, uh, say like you have 10 APIs behind your front end and one of the API fails. Uh, if you can actually just fail that part and show the remaining information to the user without failing the entire page, uh, have some sort of graceful degradation. And finally, uh, Chaos engineering, uh, it's a weird term, uh, I would say. Uh, basically what we are doing here is like, introduce chaos into the system to find issues before they find you. So you kind of uh, try to break the system uh, in a controlled environment, uh, in a controlled and safe, safer environment to find issues. Um, and, uh, automated disaster recoveries. What uh, earlier we talked about wheel of misfortunes and there is another type of thing which uh, Google runs called the dirt test, like uh, disaster recovery tests, uh, where we kind of uh, simulate events like uh, data center failures, or we try to see all scenarios which could break the system. And uh, uh, that is mostly geared towards, uh, so uh, it also identifies uh, your system vulnerabilities and also gives training to the people, like how to handle those situations. Uh, it has both these things. Um, it is also possible to automate your dis disaster recovery. Like uh, you can use things like Chaos Monkey or something, and you can have it as one of your tests to kind of like, you release it, you run, uh, uh, you kind of fail the system and see like how your system responds to certain failures. Uh, this is kind of like, uh, so that like uh, you find issues before uh, it blows up in your face. And uh, you have certain notions about your system, like the, it would be stable uh, under certain circumstances and you break that and see if your system actually holds up to that. Okay. Um, so this is the final slide. Uh, in essence, uh, what uh, we have discussed is like uh, 
have SLAs uh, and SLOs. That's a, that is how you actually define your failures and know how to define the health of the system. And uh, let the postmortems guide you. Like uh, after every incident, you write the postmortems. It will give you insights about like how your system, where your system fails, how you can uh, improve the resilience of the system, how you can shrink uh, the time to detection or shrink the time to mitigation, uh, how to prioritize uh, those action items. If you have enough postmortems, you know like uh, where to invest your engineering, um, and uh, hopefully like uh, you will reduce, uh, you will shrink the, your production incidents. Uh, thank you. Sorry about uh, running long. So do we have any questions? Thank you so much, uh, Damodaran. Uh, I think we may have exhausted our error budget on the questions. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. We don't have to borrow a term from your talk, so I've learned something new today. Um, I do. I know for sure that there'll be questions. This was a great segue from Dave's talk in the morning into uh, like a peek behind the curtain. So thank you so much because I think he covered it at a very strategic level and we got a great look at the tactical view of how to actually implement a lot of what you talked about. So I think that's pretty great.